On a quiet night in Southern California, a team of elite criminals hit one of the wealthiest banks in the country. It took months to plan and required special skills ranging from demolition to high-tech electronics to precision timing. But when the smoke had cleared, Phil Christopher and a crew of professional burglars from Collinwood, Ohio, had gotten away with an estimated $30 million in cash, bonds, and jewels from the vault of the United California Bank in Laguna Niguel, California. The Laguna Niguel bank burglary was one of the biggest cases that I've ever worked. It was as big as any bank burglary I've ever had, not only in the United States, but overseas. At the center of the wealthy and exclusive community sat the United Bank of California, a bank notorious for hiding money that its affluent customers might not want found by the IRS. When we went and interviewed the people, they would generally tell us about the jewelry that was taken, that they wouldn't tell you too much about the cash that was taken. There was a lot of cash taken. We heard later from the bad guys that they got quite a bit of cash. On March 27, 1972, the community was rocked by the news that their most precious and secret belongings had been stolen. The master burglars had blown a hole in the roof, emptied out 501 safe deposit boxes, and disappeared into the night, leaving no witnesses and not a single fingerprint. The subjects in this case not only had done something we didn't know anything about, which was dynamiting their core drilling, going through the roof, special tools to pop 501 safety deposit boxes, unidentifiable, unfindable, untraceable tools that they left behind, no witnesses and nothing to give us any glimmer of hope at the beginning. We, the FBI, had the luxury of committing a huge number of men to working this investigation. The key to pulling off the elaborate score was one man, Philip Christopher, an alarm specialist and expert safe cracker who had been perfecting the art of burglary since childhood. Phil Christopher was a very successful burglar. He was very methodical. Uh, he was very skilled with what he did. He was uh, self-educated, and he always was looking to uh, uh, better himself. Phil was the biggest and the best of the best, and he proved that to himself and, unfortunately, other uh, criminals and, and law enforcement uh, all over the world. This guy is so cool. He is so calm. He can say, man, if I ever needed a burglary, I'd come to this. This is the guy you want. They did make the mark in California, which was the biggest bank burglary history of the United States up to that time. So I guess, does that give you the title Super Thief? Makes you a pretty damn good thief. The score was so huge, it earned Phil Christopher the title Super Thief. In the 1970s, Collinwood, Ohio was exploding with tension and violence. It became home to the Italian mob and garnered a reputation as a breeding ground for burglars. I, I remember, I believe it was an FBI agent one time, he said to me, he says, I think the way the wind blows off the lake, that this whole neighborhood is nothing but a bunch of burglars. And I says, what? He says, there's something coming off the lake or somewhere that puts a chemical in people here that make them all burglars. It was a time of amazing violence, unbelievable violence, bombings, murders, but at the same time, a group of burglars were running wild. They were some of the most successful burglars this country has ever known. And they all came out of Collinwood. If they ever build a Hall of Fame for burglars, they'll build it in Collinwood because some of the most innovative burglary techniques in the world came out of that neighborhood. Back then, we're talking not quite 40 years ago, just be, a lot of banks didn't have an alarm system or, a, or a vault even. So that's why you had a lot of bank burglaries in the southeastern portion of the United States. L.A. had good secure banks back there, but they didn't have the old southeastern type bank. Where, so we didn't have any uh, need for bank burglaries out there. Do it. It's easier, so easy to rob a bank, wait, wait, wait. Burglary. In a robbery, you got kind of, all kinds of witnesses. The burglary here, you had no no witnesses. These guys were responsible for their own apprehension, basically. There was nobody that saw them go in. There's nobody that saw them inside the bank. There's nobody that saw them negotiating any of the money afterwards. These burglars are not per se going out to murder people. You know, they go in the dark. Uh, they go quietly, and 
their their whole their whole thing is to get in, take what they want to take, or steal it. And they could have a group of eight, 10, 12 people, all of which were maybe burglars, and everybody's working on their own burglary. And it might be one night, two or three of them would get together to do a burglary, and then another night, uh, another guy would come up and say, "I got this job," and he would ask whoever he wanted to go with him on that. So these these guys were working pretty constantly. Emil Dinzio, a burglar from Youngstown, began assembling a crew for a big out-of-town job. Emil was the mastermind. His brother James helped with logistics. Their in-laws, Harry and Ronnie Barber, would handle transportation and lodging. Charlie Mulligan would be stationed on a hill as a lookout. Charlie Breckel was brought along as muscle in case any unwanted visitors arrived while the crew was at work. For the last spot on the crew, Emil needed an alarm specialist. He needed someone on the cutting edge of alarm technology. He needed the best. And in 1972, the number one alarm man in the country was Phil Christopher. Well, he started as a kid, like many of these guys did, you know, with, with uh, uh, you know, lower level crimes. Eventually, he became associated with older kids that were starting to get involved uh, into uh, an adult life of crime. John Cerulli, I would say, was probably the very first person that I was ever close to in relationship to any kind of gambling or any kind of illegal thing. He was very well known in the neighborhood. Uh, he's, he did time. Uh, he, took, he took me under his arm, so to speak. And I was a young kid. And his brother had a, a, a dry cleaner but in the basement they shot dice john Cerulli brought me there and says you watch the door you know let the people in and out so i be, i let the people in and out you know and at the end of the night they gave me some money well, i was what 13. me and my friend ralph santon we were walking down the street next thing you know we walked by we saw a car that had keys in it and i uh i thought uh Let's jump in it, you know. I know how to drive this kind of car. From there, when he was that age, then he was getting involved with uh, guys that were more established, and then starting to learn from them. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that's the route that he chose. Had he chosen a legitimate line of work, I think he could have been very successful. But as it was, he uh, became very, very successful in what he he did, and that was uh, jumping out alarms, breaking into uh, uh, banks and buildings, and. Uh, breaking into vaults and safes and so forth. Phil became known around the neighborhood, and it wasn't long before Eugene Ciasulu, a member of the Mayfield Road Mob, took notice and set Phil up on his first real burglary. It was me and uh, Chucky Gabalso, Ralph Santone. Eugene Ciasulu told us that there was this uh, drugstore up on Wilson Mills in Richmond Road. So he told us, you know, how to uh, go in there, how to open up a square door safe. We never did it before. We cut a hole in the roof, me and Alec Calabrese climbed down inside, and we opened up the safe. We got uh, $1,600. So that was the first safe crack job. I knew he was different right from the very beginning, and the different people that we rubbed shoulders with were your nine to five type of people. They weren't bankers or attorneys or insurance salesmen. They were criminals. You know, he wanted to be a, a, a good burglar. I know he did. I mean, you just sensed that he was always, I remember him always looking at alarm systems wherever he went. Every time he walked in a place, he'd look at a window and see what kind of contacts it had on it. I don't care what it was. It could be a, a grocery store, it could be a, a car dealership, anything, just to look at it. Knowing how good Mr. Christopher is at what he used to do, and I emphasize used to, there wouldn't be a, a, a vault, there wouldn't be a safe, there wouldn't be a safe deposit box, uh, any place to hide your cash, jewels, valuables. He was just, he's just too good. To continue his education in the world of burglary, Phil focused his efforts on learning the ins and outs of alarm systems. I went and got a store that belonged to a friend of my father's. He said to me, Phil, whatever you want to do, do, you know, you know, whatever. So I had, I, I had uh, 
to go to do whatever I wanted. So I called the alarm company. I told them I wanted the, the best uh, kind of alarm there was with ADT. There is a serious hazard that every businessman faces constantly, and that is burglary. If that had been an automatically protected property, the chances are we would have had that fellow by this time. I can show you with a drawing. Let's pretend he somehow has reached the building outside a window. If he breaks that window, he flashes a signal. If he jimmies it open without breaking it, he still flashes a signal. ADT already knows it. The police are already on the way. Well, all I've got to say is, I don't see how a burglar can make a decent living anymore. He can't. Not from a place that is automatically protected. In fact, most burglars shy away the minute they see the sign. Because the professionals, at least, know that they just can't beat the science of electric protection. So I called the alarm company. I told them I wanted to install this certain kind of alarm. Now, if anything happens while I'm learning to bypass it, I just says, oh, I'm here. I made a, something was a faulty alarm, whatever, no big thing. You know, so that's what I did. You know, there's no such thing that is 100% um, guaranteed protected. You had to learn how the alarm company works. You had to learn how to put your box in a proper perspective on their system and eliminate their system, uh, if you understand what I'm saying. There will be a flag that was in the alarm company. If the flag fell, that meant the alarm went off. But it was so fast. I knew how to open the line I would read the uh, the bill amps, and and I knew the voltage, so I figured out the resistance mathematically, and I set my resistance, and, and I would just throw my switch, single pull, double throw switch, boom, bang, off, on. That's it. The part is over. You know, you do what you got to do. He knew alarm box is really good. You know, not only have to know alarm boxes, if they're simple, you can handle them without too much background. But you also have to know people who can get you information about those alarm boxes. Because as burglars became more sophisticated, the alarm companies became more sophisticated. So you just couldn't go in there and start cutting a bunch of wires to disarm them. You might set off another alarm. So not only was Phil Christopher good at his work, he had uh, inroads and contacts to people who would get him information about the alarm boxes he was gonna work on. Those make burglaries really easy. Once you silence the alarm, you have plenty of time to get in and get out without uh, being discovered. And one night when we were driving by Phil Christopher's house, we saw a car parked out in front. And the license number on the car came back to a man who had a record, he worked for ADT put one and one together, you get two. He was learning, Phil was learning about alarms from this man. Frank, ADT employee, kept me informed what kind of systems there were in there, how many systems in there. If need be, I was able to call him after I bypassed the alarm and just pretend like we talked about something off the wall in case the phones were, were bugged. Uh, to see if uh, I had a problem or not, or if the alarm, I bypassed the alarm with no problem at all. He went up in our estimation, he became the alarm man uh, that they used for their major jobs. And so we began to pay more and more attention to Phil. The best part of the whole thing is, if I have a law officer watching my back, if I have a guy that works at an AGT company watching my back, you want to make some money? Watch my back and I take care of you. As simple as that. I was able to do with anybody because people like money, you know? And I'm not hurting nobody. The only people I'm hurting is the insurance companies. Insurance companies. They're the biggest, to me, they're the biggest, uh, I don't want to say thieves, but they, 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 they got their, their hands in the, in the pot very well. During his tenure with the Cleveland PD, 
Rocco Pelutro's path would cross with Phil's many times. One of the first was a raid on Christopher's home in Collinwood. I went down in the basement and came back and told the sergeant, I said, it's an alarm factory. There were ADT alarm boxes, which shocked me because usually you wouldn't even find a jack in their cars. They knew they were going to get stopped. During the house search, we found additional alarm equipment and things that he'd been obviously working on taking apart and trying to do whatever he was going to do. There was a telephone book, personal telephone book. In there was a notation, Denny the cop, with a phone number. We took the phone number to the phone company, and that phone number was to Dennis King, sergeant in the 6th District. The psychology involved is something that you'd have to question. You would ask yourself, if you could take tenured police officers, ADT people, people with money, legitimate people, and, and involve them in your criminal enterprise, I mean, these people, if they ever applied these skills to, to a legitimate job, would probably be millionaires. But they don't get the same rush. <laughs> that was on one, one score, I had the uh, police car take us up the back door with our tools and everything and drop us off. To pull off these burglaries that uh, uh, take planning and time and a certain amount of uh, courage to, you know, put yourself in their shoes. I mean, breaking into a place and police cars going by. And uh, I, I, uh, I always had a, a certain amount of respect for nonviolent burglars that were good, you know, and I knew quite a few of them. When Ronnie Carabia, a member of Collinwood's notorious Mayfield Road mob, heard that the Dinzios were looking for the best alarm specialists in the business, he knew exactly who to call. Well, they had an idea of the types of people who could pull that type of cape. It wouldn't be a rookie that could, could do that. Joe Shooty and, uh, um... Ronnie Carabia, they were, they were very tight. They had uh, a lot of different things going on. As a matter of fact, uh, that's what Ronnie Car uh, called me to come down there and uh, he wanted, wanted to uh, talk with me. And uh, so I came in. That's when I uh, talked with uh, Emil Dinsio and uh, James Dinsio. And that's when we got involved in the California job. That's where that initiated. They told me point blank. We need somebody that knows the alarm. There was no telling exactly what was there, but the area was very exclusive. It sat very, very nice. And they asked me, uh, who, who do I move with? I said, I'm going to move Charlie Brunch. Charlie came there with me. He got in a fight up in the bar, and I had to grab him, and he was going to shoot someone. I stopped him from doing that because he was a, a loose cannon. In his 20s, Phil found himself in many precarious situations. Where there was trouble, it seemed, there was Phil's best friend, Charlie Breckel. Charlie was the type that always had Phil's back. Philip went and did whatever it is he had to do, but he knew that he always had uh, Charlie behind him to back him up. They were good friends. Char Philip uh, would have to calm Charlie down a bit. Charlie liked to drink. Charlie had a short temper. Charlie always carried a gun. Philip doesn't like guns. He would have to put Charlie in check at times, but he always knew or thought he knew that Charlie always had his back. I'm going uh, on scores with people that I, I, I know, but I really don't know. So I need somebody watching my back, too. You know, I didn't know, and I know Charlie would watch my back. I understood, even during that time, that they were extremely close. I, again, I didn't go out with them socially, but I talked to, to Phil a number of times. I talked to Charlie a number of times. And they were about as close as two guys could be. At least that's the impression they gave to me, that they were extremely close. I knew they both were burglars. I knew that. That wasn't didn't come to me as a surprise. But I thought they were good friends. When you deal with people like this, you assume they're just a burglar. Well, some of these guys are really bad, and Charlie was one of them. Bad in the sense that he was violent bad. Good burglars only want to get in, get out, steal what they can, and make money that way. All they want to do is get in there and steal. But Charlie was one of these guys. I think he was involved in burglaries where the murders occurred. I wouldn't be not surprised if he was one of the guys that did the killing either. I never liked him, and I thought that was probably the worst person Phil could ever be friends with. There was a street called 140th Street, and there was a little bar in the corner. He actually shot a guy because the guy wouldn't get off the bar stool fast enough. He was a heavy gambler, drug user. I thought he was just a 
cheap person, uh, a show off. Phil liked them, but I didn't like them, and a lot of people didn't like them. Well, I knew Phil because I represented Charlie Breckle. These were the top burglars in the country, so far as I'm concerned, because they really knew what they were doing. Our objective was to make money. I always used to say, I'm going to retire when I'm 30 years old and be a millionaire. I thought I had the way to do it. I bypass the system, I make the end, and I open the safe. All I need is them to carry my tools and watch my back. We were the best. I mean, God, I mean, I mean, we were the best. So anyways, I, to I told Charlie when we left, after after Ronnie introduced uh, me to Amon James, uh, that we had this thing going down in, in California. The stage was set for what the burglars saw as a prime score. They had no idea that they were about to execute the biggest bank burglary in the history of the United States. The United California Bank in the unassuming Monarch Bay Plaza strip mall of Laguna Niguel was where the upscale area's wealthy residents stored their cash and valuables. There was some indication that, that Nixon, President Nixon, has a summer place down in San Clemente, California, which is just a few miles, 10, 10 12 miles south of the, of the bank there. A lot of people think that he was uh, secreting uh, funds into the bank and we had a safe deposit box and everything. And supposedly that was the reason I hit the bank. I think that's totally uh, hogwash and uh, even worse than hogwash sometimes, but uh, it's hogwash anyway. All I know is me and Charity and Amy were driving, we were checking the area out, you know, watching the things we were driving. Amy made mention about Nixon's bank. I says, we can't do that, are you crazy? And we, we laughed about it, you know. Oh, that's crazy, are you crazy? How, why, would you, why would you even think about going after a bank where it presents? Are you crazy? Though Nixon's secret stash at the Laguna Niguel Bank was just a rumor, the crew spent countless hours preparing for what they hoped would be a big score. Standing between them and the biggest hall in the history of bank burglaries were an on-site audible alarm, silent alarm, 18-inch thick concrete and rebar enforced walls, a massive time lock steel door, and double key safe deposit boxes. After a month of planning and several scouting trips to Southern California, the moment of truth finally arrived. Phil and Charlie Breckel went to the Cleveland airport with every intention of sticking to the plan. But from the very beginning, the job that had been planned to a T began to go wrong. Well, they had uh, fake IDs made, uh, but uh, Charlie Breckel was supposed to bring those fake IDs with him when he forgot them. Well, they decided they didn't want to scrap the uh, the, the uh, travel plans to go out to California, uh, which was a mistake. We were at the airport that day. I says, you need a license. Oh, I forgot it. We're in the airport. We're about to get our, our ticket, go on a plane. How in the same hell can you forget something as important as that? So I was aggravated. So then I thought, well, I, I know Am uh, Amos will be on the plane, and uh, so is uh, Charlie Mulligan. So I, I know they're going to be on the plane. I didn't want to show the stupidity of my partner, and I just chose, uh, well, I don't think that we're going to have a problem anyways, you know. I said, you know, we'll, we'll just use our own names, you know. So we had to sure, sure oh, our own driver's license. I didn't want to do it that way, but uh, I, ch I changed my bet. I, I went my, against my better judgment. Using their own identities, Phil and the crew headed for Southern California. We got off the plane. We all got into the same taxi cab, and we uh, went on our merry old way to Ronnie Barber's house. And then uh, from there, we went on to the uh, condo. For the base of their operations, the crew had chosen a condo in walking distance from the bank. The day they arrived, they went to this family. They gave them $3,000, and they said, you're on vacation for a week. So the guy and his wife took their children, and they left. And the house was theirs to use, the mobs. And uh, they worked out of that house. 
casing this bank. They were bird watchers, but really they were watching the bank. People would come by, they all had their binoculars out and they were looking in the trees, but they were really focusing on this bank. As we watched it for a couple of days prior to making our initial move, there was no patrolling the area uh, at all in relation to these cars or anything like that. And, uh, and the access to the roof was very good. There was nothing else in the area. It was just uh, a very, very good score because of the, the, the way it sat. With their lodging set, the crew now needed transportation. James used the classifieds to purchase a Joe Blow car. Joe Blow car is that a, a car that uh, is not a stolen car, but a legitimate car, but the name is a phony name doesn't go back to anybody. Well, we needed a, a, a pickup driver. Just in case something went wrong, we had to get out and run. We already had a discussion where we would run and how to, and where to pick us up at. Harry Barber was the, the driver of the car. His brother, Ron, stayed inside the condominium and he listened to the police radio. There was uh, four walkies, there was one in the condo, one in the car, one on a lookout, and one with us. If he heard anything, he would contact uh, us through the, through the walk. These are special walkies. Back then, they had these little crystals that you would plug in to get on a certain frequency. So in order to have a better communication, we had an individual that was able to make crystals for us. They were in the frequencies like with the CIA have or something like that, you know, a frequency you're not supposed to have. So there was Charlie Mulligan on top of the hill that overlooked where the bank was at. Myself, uh, Amo, James, and Charlie Brock. All of their planning complete, Phil and the crew made final preparations in the condo for what was shaping up to be the perfect score. We would uh, get rags and uh, alcohol and wipe everything down make sure that there's no fingerprints on any of the equipment that we had. We put it in, in different bags for different operations of our burglary. They got all the, everything, all the tools that they needed. They even made a special pry bar for a safety deposit box that looked like an upside down F where they would insert it in there and they weren't going to try and, you know, pick the locks or anything. They just ripped these boxes out once they got in there. From the beginning, this bank burglary was different. And it was different because of the level of sophistication and factors that we not only had not seen but had not heard about, at least in uh, the greater Los Angeles area ever. We went around and we looked around uh, for a ladder. I forget what kind of church it was. It wasn't too far away. We took the ladder from there and we went up on the ladder. Charlie Breckles pulled the ladder down and put it out of sight while we were on the roof. So it was just James, Emil, and myself on a roof, and we were the ones that did, did everything. After checking for exterior alarms, Phil and the Dinzio brothers drilled and cut their way into the bank ceiling. Once that was done, Emil and I both went down on top of the vault, and we crawled over this, this catwalk and went climbed down this ladder down inside. We pulled our mask over our face just in case there was some kind of system in there that set the alarm off so they couldn't get no picture of us. So we started looking for where the telephone lines were because that's where we would uh, bypass the system, jump it out. Amy and I got the equipment out and we started going through the wires. So I started going through the process of elimination through all the telephone lines and I didn't understand it. I couldn't find the voltage that I, I needed to show that there was, that was the alarm. We decided to close up shop, back off and try to think this out, what we're gonna do here. Because at this point in time, it started getting late after we, we did all this stuff. So we climbed up back up on the roof and we covered up the hole we made and then we back and we, and we left. The crew was ready to accept defeat, but Phil Christopher wouldn't give up. For him, defeat was not an option. His path had been forged long before 1972, on the rough streets of Cleveland. Though he had begun his criminal exploits at a young age, Phil's childhood held many hardships that would leave him with an insatiable desire for success. The neighborhood was 
as I already said, predominantly Italian. Uh, it was a, basically uh, a hard work in middle class area, but also had a lot of gangsters. I played a lot of sports. I, I, I have a lot of trophies. I was in a YMCA. I had trophies for archery, uh, trophies for baseball, uh, and a, a number of trophies. Phil was the best at everything he did, but his good fortune would soon come to an end. It was just uh, the beginning of summer vacation when I was diagnosed with the rheumatic fever. My parents had brought the, my bed downstairs and put it in the living room because I was unable to walk. My father was very concerned about my well-being because he didn't want me to get sick again. My, my father and mother, they, they loved me. Concerned for his health, when Phil finally got over the rheumatic fever, his parents forbade him from playing sports. His drive to be the best ended up bringing him to the number one local pastime in Collinwood, crime. I started recognizing material items when I was going to high school. I started doing things that are not normal, actually. A friend of mine, we uh, used to go to this one store and we would be help, pretend like we were helping out, and, but in the meantime, we help ourselves, you know, to their, their money. That went out for quite a few years. I would shake down kids in school, you know, I would. Uh, Muslim for money. Matter of fact, it got to the point where guys used to call me money bags, you know, MB, you know, I got the nickname MB, you know. And uh, it was uh, pretty nice. I'm thinking today, maybe if I would have played sports, I might have might have ventured a different road instead of a uh, road that went into uh, illegal activity. By 1972, Phil Christopher had been in and out of prison more times than he could remember. Through trial and error, he set himself apart as one of the best alarm men in the business. Phil's obsession with being the best sometimes meant partnering with unsavory characters. It was Phil's association with two such operators that got him involved in an alleged murder for hire plot. With all these guys, Phil Christopher's name would become would come up. You never pin anything on him, but they you knew that he was with these guys, very thick with them, in in a lot of burglaries, even suggested in some murders, like he was involved in the murder of a guy named Arnie Prunella, uh, the Cobain brothers, and, uh, took this guy Prunella out in Lake Erie and murdered him. Skilbane brothers came to me. They were having a problem with this Arnie Pernella. So I told them, I said, well, we'll go buy a boat. So they went and uh, bought a boat. Next thing, they're at my doorstep, ready to go. Got on a boat, went way out on the lake at nighttime, and, uh, and shot him in the back of the head. We didn't really realize just how important he was to that group of burglars and later team of hitmen that tried to kill uh, an organized crime figure named uh, Danny Green. Danny Green's war with the Mayfield Road mob made him a Collinwood legend. And it's rumored that many men, including Butchie's sister Nino, Ray Ferrito, and Phil Christopher tried to cash in on the bounty that was placed on his head. You know, uh, be because of uh, who I ran with in the streets, uh, when the uh, thing came down on uh, about uh, the Arnie Prunella, well, uh, next thing you know, uh, they uh, had me as a uh, hitman, you know, an assassin. And, and any layman reading a paper, read it, and, they, and they, they say, oh, this guy killed this guy, oh, this guy killed this guy. I didn't kill them. Phil's unyielding drive for success wouldn't let him give up on the alarm system at the United California Bank. While the rest of the crew contemplated pulling the plug on the score, Phil just couldn't let it go. I was into always, I was always jogging. There's a golf course behind the condo. So I made a perfect spot to go for a little jog. So I was out there jogging, and then it popped in my head. There's various ways of hooking up these old-time 
alarms, but uh, we didn't check. We didn't check for that. So, well, anyway, Sunday we did it again. Climbed back up on there, went down inside, and sure enough, here it was. You know, this, this look I felt. In order to knock the circuit out, we had to be very careful because there's a bell outside too. It, sure, we can eliminate the circuit, but once we eliminate the circuit that's going anywhere to a police station or an alarm company, the bell's gonna go off. Emil and I went around in front of the building in, in, into the dark of the bushes because there was uh, spotlights uh, from the poles in front of the place. We needed to get a little bit of darkness because the Pacific Coast Highway is right there. So we cut the wires and we knocked off that particular light. We threw the, uh, the ladder up real quick. Uh, uh, James crawled, crawled up the ladder with this uh, mixture, uh, two uh, cylinders. When you mix them together, they turn into styrofoam and we shot it into the bell mechanism of the box. Now, uh, when we went down the side, we had a separate bag of tools, with, which was for the alarms. We would have a little wire jumper clips, uh, voltmeters, uh, mill amps. We had potentiometers, we had batteries. We were ready for just about any kind of a system that we were running up against. James, Amo, and myself went up the ladder. We went, went inside uh, on top of the vault and uh, proceeded to uh, start drilling. We had a special made drill that went 2,500 revolutions per minute because it was quiet, number one, and number two, because it was faster than a normal drill and it wouldn't make, as, it wouldn't make any noise like uh, they had the drills they have to cut into concrete. And we would use one inch concrete drill bits to drill the holes in, into the concrete. We would get a stick of dynamite and cut it and stick it in the holes. And then we needed sandbags. So I went back down on the ground uh, and I got a shovel and uh, Charlie was holding the bags and I was filling them up. Got about 20 bags up there, then we blew. I remember just walking away to the edge of the building to tell Charlie we blew, we're you know, gonna go in now. Uh, yes. When are you guys gonna blow? I says we did already. He says we're. I didn't hear it. Well, good, you didn't hear it. I mean, <laughs> you're not supposed to hear it. Let's go get our money. You know, let's go do our work, do our thing. You know, what we're. This is what we. Uh, this is what we're all about. It was an amazing bank job. Uh, they had their own hammer that they milled, that was incredibly effective. To, to pop 500 boxes is a lot of work, and that. Uh, this uh, way saved them a lot of time, and it was good. Well, there was a whole wall of safety deposit boxes. Emil and I uh, worked very close together. The lead sledge that we had was made purposely so it didn't make a loud noise when you hit steel. This is uh, the kind of hammer that they used when they broke into those um, safety deposit boxes. But you see how they made this tool to, for a specific purpose, smashing that lock and knocking it out. We were soaking wet of sweat because your adrenaline's going, you're working hard, you want to get out of there as fast as you can. We were just flipping the lid open and dumping it in, in a bag. It didn't take our time to examine. We'll examine it once we get back out of there. A call from outside came over the walkie, warning the thieves that someone was coming. Here we got warned from outside from Charlie Mulligan that somebody was coming inside. So most naturally, you gotta keep quiet. We're inside the vault, you know. We figured it was a cleanup person. Anyways, Mulligan says, somebody just pulled up in front. The guys walked into the front door. The guys opened it. When Charlie coughed. I, lo I looked at him. And we all looked at him in, in astonishment, you know. What is wrong with you, you nuts? You know, and I grabbed it, I, I put my hand over so, you know, and they were get out of get out get out of here, you know. So we grabbed him, we almost literally just threw him right up through the roof, you know, to the top, you know, to get out of there, you know. Thank God the, the, uh, the guy didn't hear it, and we'd be in deep trouble. The only evidence of the break-in was inside the vault with the burglars. The crew was able to remain quiet enough to evade detection. They grabbed everything they could, 
loaded it into bags, and made their escape by moonlight. Gold coins, silver coins, cash, jewelry, everything that they could fence, use, spend, without having it attached to uh, either a victim's name or traceable back to them. I never figured out or I never knew how they got all of this out of there. They must have had duffel bags filled with valuables and money and bonds. There was three bags, and they were enormous. Down, down near 5 o'clock in the morning, I think, when we, we came uh, walking uh, into the condo, you know. Then it slowly got light, you know. So we got there just in the nick of time. Phil and the crew had emptied nearly all of the safe deposit boxes. As they counted their score, they began to realize just how successful they had been. When we went back there, they uh, uh, they dumped everything out on the floor to pile of bear bonds, and, uh, the cash or the, the gold or diamonds because they kept that sort of on the side. But uh, the bear bonds, you know, was looking, looking at it over over their shoulders as, as they were looking through them. You know, you see 100,000 of this, 50,000, 200. Thousand. I mean, they started adding them up. They were stacking them up, and and I forget how, uh, how many how many million were already. Uh, they figured it, and they didn't. Even, they were not even done with half of it. We'll never know exactly how much money they did have in there because a good part of the loss that came from that bank burglary uh, came from safe deposit boxes. The, the bank itself only lost about $45,000 in cash that was in the vault, including some bait money. But there were uh, 501 safe deposit boxes that got opened up and the contents taken out. The estimates run anywhere from 7 million up to 15, 20, 30 million, even higher. We, we have no way of really knowing exactly how much it was taken out of there. But I would say it was probably in the neighborhood, minimum 25 and could have gone 70 million, even higher, from things we picked up along the line. I said, oh my God, you know. So, sort of like we sort of like guesstimated it, you know. If I'm correct, Charlie Mulligan actually said it, that there was like $30 million. That's how we figured out how much money was in bearer bonds alone, not be, not counting the gold and, and the cash, but there was some diamonds in there that was so big they looked fake. With a score this big, the crew knew they had to get out of town fast. They left their tools in the trunk of the Joe Blow car and took the first flight back to Cleveland. This heist wouldn't stay secret for long. It was all brought back in a boat uh, that James uh, Denzio bought. Bought a speedboat down in California. They trailered it back in. All the bear bonds, the cash, the gold, the diamonds, you know, a speedboat. So they, they pulled this bank ro uh, robbery. Um, they put everything into this boat, cover it up, and they're towing it. Now they drove back through Southern California to Louisiana. They fenced millions of dollars worth of bearer bonds. And I, I don't know how much, but a lot. Then he drove back to Cleveland. Well, a fence w was someone who was in that world of, of crime, organized crime, and worked with a lot of burglars and thieves. And he was someone that specialized in finding buyers for stolen property whatever kind of stolen property that, that might be. Uh, one of the best known fences here in Cleveland was uh, a guy by the name of Shonder Burns. And he was the first guy that they went to with those bearer bonds. And uh, he, he was going to fence them for them. And, and let's say they would, uh, they might get like 50 cents on the dollar, you know, for maybe they get half the value with the bearer bonds. Charlie Bruckles and I, which I didn't like be, even being involved with fencing, I never went to fences ever. The first time I went to a fence, I uh, went to see Shondo Burns down, down at Theatrical Grill. He tried to, he tried to get him to fence it. Back in Laguna Niguel, the feds were dumbfounded by the sophistication of the burglary. It would be weeks before they even had a lead. Upon the completion of their job, when they're leaving the bank, they drilled a hole into the alarm mechanism. The uh, timing mechanism on the inside of the bank vault, disabling the timer so that the bank door wouldn't open on Monday morning. It was deactivated. They couldn't get into that vault. And it took, it, it got, it bought the bad guys at least eight, maybe 10 hours of additional time in that uh, the, the bank subsequently had a send out for a bank vault expert to see about getting into this vault, opening it up. 
He was unable, unable to do it from the inside. So then in an attempt to see if he could maybe get access from the outside himself, he actually went up on the roof and found that, uh-oh, I'm, I'm not the first guy here, I'm the second guy here. And so that bought them an entire day where we didn't know, no one knew that there was a bank burglary. The scene at the bank was one of absolute confusion. The bank vault was open. A number of approximately 500 safety deposit boxes had been ripped open and the contents dumped on the floor. Uh, it was uh, knee high with debris. Also, there was uh, debris from the break-in itself through the roof, which you had tile, you had concrete, you had a, a lot of byproducts from a break-in. I got assigned to this case specifically because I had experience working other major crimes and was used to working with a uh, very bad set of facts. This Laguna Niguel bank burglary was a in an incredibly important community in Southern California with a vast array of wealth um, owned by the individuals who frequented that bank and who lived around there. The burglary itself was so well done that it was beyond our an, an initial scope of investigative skills. Ray Frieda was a big boss in Erie, Pennsylvania, but he was staying out there in California. He called me, he said, are you up here in Cal uh, California, you know, uh, recently? I said, no, why? He said, what are you talking about? Well, something happened up here. I said, well, I don't know why. I told him I was bear hunting. I said, I was bear hunting. So I knew right away he, he had a feeling that we were, we were up there. Word of the massive burglary had spread through the criminal underworld, who recognized the Youngstown, Ohio crew's signature style much faster than the authorities could put the clues together. The obvious scope of the loss and the type of people who suffered that loss caused there to be a lot of scrutiny and heat on this specific investigation. And therefore, uh, we, the FBI, had the luxury of committing a huge number of men to working this investigation. The teamwork put it together. Yeah, one or two people could have never had it. We fortunately had the, uh, the resources. We had good supervision over it that, that made sure we had the resources available to us. Even with a huge number of men, for six weeks to two months, we had absolutely nothing. And it's very hard to even imagine what a huge number of men would do because we had no leads to commit them to. The thing that changed it all was Cleveland office of the FBI, who had uh, had a number of bank burglaries, also unsolvable in their territory, in which the method of operation was incredibly similar to ours. LA may be the bank robbery capital, it was then and still is today, the bank robbery capital of the world, but it's never been the bank burglary capital. This was a very sophisticated operation. You could tell by the tools, the way they had disguised their tools, how we tried to trace some of them back, we couldn't trace them back. Certain numbers had been removed later on. Law enforcement on the East Coast identified a group, a loose-knit group of um, burglars, bank burglars, uh, with approximately 23 names. Emil Dinsio was one of those 23 names. Philip Bruce Christopher was one of the 23 names. However, we did not know in which, if any of those individuals, was involved in Laguna Niguel. The absolute break in this case, absolute break, and the break if had not occurred, we'd still be investigating Laguna Niguel today, was the taking of these 23 names and running them through manifests of the different airlines. And we're talking in the 70s, it was not a computerized, easy thing to do. And <clears throat> you had to get the FBI office in question to go to the airline in question and try to get them to do this for us. Subsequently, we found that six people flew to Los Angeles on one flight, and all six of those people were on our list of uh, burglars from the East Coast. Who would have thought that six organized crime-related individuals would use their true name and fly to LA, um, leaving a record behind of them of when they came and when they arrived. Phil was connected to the other burglaries, not from a, a proof point of view, but from knowledge of uh, the FBI, specifically in Cleveland. They knew that he was on several of similar jobs that occurred on the East Coast. We, as intelligence unit detectives, had, had cultivated 
special relationships with Jan Roberson's bank robbery squad guys. We were working together. And when you start sharing information, you start putting bad guys in jail. I got a call from Roberson. Asked me to meet him at the FBI office. I did. And he said, there's just been a major bank burglary in Laguna Niguel. And all offices all over the country have been asked to send in names of people who they think could be responsible to be involved in that crime. So we discussed the entry. We discussed how the alarm was bypassed, which interested me. And I said, you know, John, I'll bet my bottom dollar that Phil Christopher had to do that alarm. That sounds like all the other ones that he has done in the past. We did our homework. We figured they had to go someplace from, from L.A. Uh, once they got to L.A. So we interviewed every single cab driver in, that came to L.A. Now let me tell you, that was a job. That was a job and a half. We interviewed every single cab driver that picked up any fares during this period. And we, lo and behold, we found one individual, picked up five people from LAX, and he took them to a residence out in Southgate. And at that residence out in Southgate, lived the uh, sister, a gal by the name of Barbara, of the two Denzio brothers, Viola Barber. You know, you can't uh, charge anybody with going out and visiting their sister-in-law. So, but we continued to do, do work, and we, we figured, well, these guys are high rollers. My partner, Dick Thomas, uh, we, he couldn't believe that these guys stayed at a high roller place. Dick hit one of these truck stop, kind of a cheap place, uh, Jubilee Motel down in Linwood, and found out, lo and behold, uh, Emil Denzio and his wife Linda and Mulligan stayed out there for about a 10-day period just prior to the burglary. We ran the phones that they used, and we found they had made uh, several phone calls, including phone calls to a fellow by the name of Earl Randall Dawson down in Tustin, California, which is down in Orange County and not too far from where the bank, probably 10, 12 miles from where the bank was burgled. The next great lead was, of course, uh, Dawson being interviewed by Frank Kelly, who had seen his old buddy Mulligan, who'd flown in before that and left a vehicle in his garage. So I went out to interview Mr. Dawson, who lived in nearby Tustin. We swung by Dawson's Tustin home early in the morning, it's probably 9, 9.30, 10, a quarter to 10, something the latest. Dawson wasn't there. He liked to drink at a bar, I think it was called the Walnut Room or something like that on Walnut Street in Tustin. So I figured, well, let's see if He's having a little libation this early in the morning, so Conway and I go to the bar. Dawson was shooting pool, so we just looked at Dawson. Pretty soon, Dawson comes over to me and says, are you looking at me? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, we'd like to talk to you about some friends of yours, but this is probably not the place. He said, well, let's go by my house. It was at Earl Dawson's house that Frank Kelly caught a lucky break in the case. Some people have a lot of luck, and some people had no luck. Mulligan had no luck that day. Mulligan calls Dawson while well, Conway and I are talking to him. Phone rings and Dawson answers. He gets on the phone. He cups the phone. He says, hey, it's Mulligan, which made me think right away. Well, maybe he knows. <laughs> Dawson knows a little bit more than he's telling us. I, he said, points to another room. There's another phone extension room. He says, go ahead and listen. Mulligan says, yeah, I'm flying out tonight. And uh, he's what, to test him? He said, yeah. I said, how come you're coming out tonight? He said, oh, I'm going to come out. He said, I want to get rid of that car that's in the garage. I want to remove the car. And he said, how come? He said, well, the FBI's been out here checking checking on uh, on me and some of those friends. And he said, what friends? He said, you know, the ones you met, Denzio's and stuff. They're out here checking. He said, what about, oh, they think we might have been involved in a bank burglary. And Based on Mulligan's admissions, Callie obtained a search warrant for the car in Earl Dawson's garage. The vehicle in question turned out to be the Joe Blow car. The crew had fitted the trunk of the 62 Oldsmobile with a false bottom to store their equipment. Massive mistake was to leave a vehicle with what turned out to be identifiable items from the bank burglary in that car. In the garage is a car, they open up the car and there's a couple of gold coins in the trunk. I think they got fingerprints off this car from everybody involved, including Charlie Breckles. 
I don't know if they matched the fingerprints at that time, but I knew that they had the fingerprints of the people involved. They just didn't know who the fingerprints were. The case was finally beginning to come together for the investigators. Fingerprints and phone records led them to the Laguna Niguel condo that the crew had called home while pulling the score. It was directly across a golf course from the bank, a condominium townhouses. There was uh, remnants of burned uh, papers. Obviously, a fire had been set inside this place to burn evidence. The, all the walls had been wiped down. Everything in that place was pristine and clean with no fingerprints. It's one of the search party members opened the dishwasher and concluded that every dirty dish in the world was in there and that someone had forgotten to turn the dishwasher on as they left the condominium. On those dishes, subsequently, FBI laboratory identified at least four additional individuals who were part of our group from those fingerprints. This is all part of this air of arrogance that I thought these individuals brought to Los Angeles with them. The only reason you would leave that car behind with every piece of incriminating information known to man was that you were gonna commit another bank burglary in Los Angeles. Remember, when he was coming back, Laguna de Gale was not solved, Lordstown was not solved, and these guys were riding high. At that time, you know, the world wasn't computerized, so they did just take a fingerprint and run it through a computer and came up with a name or something like that. That case sat and waited while they still investigated, but they weren't sure who did it. And then there was later a Lordstown bank robbery uh, in Lordstown, Ohio. The feds uh, weren't on to us at the beginning until we uh, did the Lordstown. So now that sort of like narrowed it and zoomed it in on us and young guys in Youngstown and guys in Cleveland. Well, the, the, the motivation for hitting the bank in Lordstown very shortly after they just hit the bank in Laguna Niguel, California, um, was because there wasn't that much cash that they brought out of the bank in Laguna Niguel, California. Well, these, these guys like the cash. Cash is king, you know. Uh, so they decided, you know, they, they, they had a system, they got into this bank, things went well. They decided to go ahead and hit the, uh, the bank in Lordstown, Ohio, and they used the same method, jumping out the alarm, blasting in through the roof. And that, of course, attracted the attention of the FBI and other law enforcement investigators who were involved in the Laguna Niguel heist, because now they had another bank burglary, again, a, a very rare crime, committed with the same uh, M.O. There again, that was uh, Amal and James. They, they came to me, uh, they wanted to go on uh, the score. They asked me to come, but they didn't want me to bring Charlie Brockles with me this time. And I says, why not? This guy doesn't do that. What does he do? This, uh, he, he doesn't help out. What, you know? I said, what if I bring him? I says, um, I give him half my hand. It worked out. They, they agreed upon us. They said, well, all right, it's up to you. And eventually, they saw the Lordstown uh, robbery, burglary. And that led to them breaking down Charlie Breckles, whose fingerprints were involved in the Lagoon and Nigel. And Charlie Breckles caved in and gave him everybody else. Charlie Breckle was an unindicted co-conspirator who was in fear for his life. When you're dealing with a, a group of very bad people, uh, and you're not charged along with the rest of the people, and you know you were on that job, it's usually life-threatening because you are not charged with the other people who knew you were on the burglary with them. Therefore, you could easily be a witness. Charles Brackles became a cooperating government witness. Now, the next question you should ask me is, why did he do that? Charles Brackles was never a talker. But it got to be a point in his life where he was arrested, he was going to be charged, and he was going to go away for a long time. He decided that he wanted to talk to law enforcement, and he didn't trust a lot of people. I mean, there's paranoia in all these professional thieves. He was facing a lot of prison time. I think it was something like up to 20 years. And uh, uh, Charlie Brucker was not ready to do 20 years in, in uh, prison. And uh, they were able to, you know, apply the pressure that they normally would for a criminal uh, in, that, uh, in that situation. What Charlie Breckel was put in a bind 
we, we, we set him up. Breck was the only guy we didn't have enough information on to, to really convict him. We had close, and we would, get, we would have gotten it. But if you make a guy an undecided co-conspirator, everybody thinks he's rolled over and sold out to the government. And this poor guy was <laughs> screwed. <laughs> that, he had no choice. Charlie had indeed written a letter to the FBI saying he wanted to be a snitch and get in the Witness Protective Program. Once they broke down Breckles, he gave him Lordstown and he gave him Laguna Night Jail. I don't think he ever went to jail for either one of those, so he had to be an informant that was later um, regularly used by the FBI for information. I was very upset uh, and uh, that I felt like I'd been, I felt like I'd been violated. You know, uh, my trust uh, in a friend and I thought was a, a good close friend. Matter of fact, he even gave me a, a, a lighter one time to to my brother, you know, and I thought, well, I, I thought we were tight, you know what I mean? Because uh, we might have been close, but I guess, uh, I guess he was more concerned about his self well-being than, uh, than mine. I remember being at, at the theatrical restaurant with Shonda Burns. And some people came in and said, Charlie Breckle's going to testify this evening at 1.30. And Burns, he said, I have to see this for myself. So I said, well, I want to see it too. <laughs> because I was the most surprised person in the world to know that Charlie Breckle was, was a government witness. I always believed that Charlie was as tough a guy as I'd ever known. And he always proved that to me. But I was a little taken aback when they told me that Charlie Breckle was going to be on the witness stand. So I walked over to the federal court with Shonda Burns. And uh, we sat there, and they, Breckle came in, and they swore Breckle in, and he started testifying. And Burns got up and walked out into the hall said, I'll see you. I'll wait for you outside. I stayed in there about five or ten minutes listening to Breckle. When he got into his parrot routine, he was beginning to talk like a parrot. So I went out into the hall. And I said, John, why'd you leave? He said, I felt I was going to vomit. <laughs> Didn't surprise me at all. I always used to say that when somebody accuses somebody of doing something all the time, like he used to call everybody a snitch. That guy's a snitch. That guy, anybody does that to me was, a, was the snitch. I just, something in my mind told me that. I, I, I didn't think he would, you know, you don't think he would, but then when he did, it did not surprise me at all. Based on Charlie Breckel's testimony, the FBI had all the evidence they needed. Arrest warrants went out for Phil, Emil, James, and the rest of the Youngstown crew. One by one, the FBI rounded up the crew. Rare coins and cash from the Laguna Niguel burglary were found buried in Emil Dinzio's house. There were two uh, recoveries made. One was a, uh, a bunch of money that was found buried across the street from the uh, Dinzio's house. And the other one, I think, was James ex-wife's property had a bunch of security buried on that. The one right across from Amos' house, a young kid had found several thousand dollars <laughs> and called the law enforcement. And they came out and got this, picked it up. And lo and behold, it's right across the street from Amos Dinzio. Well, pretty soon the, the police and the FBI, that was just to give them additional probable cause for his arrest. So uh, Amos' arrest. So that, that, many, that money tied into the bank burglary. Uh, and then as far as James goes, I think they found a whole bag with a whole bunch of securities in his ex-wife's property. The FBI then turned their attention to Phil Christopher, the alarm specialist. Basically because of his association with the Denzios in the past as a suspect in prior bank burglaries. He's, he's flying on the plane with the Denzio. <laughs> and he gets out here, and so he's flying on a plane with the same plane with these guys. And we didn't take that long, you know. They used the true names. Phil would later comment that his biggest mistake was not trusting his instincts and taking a different flight when Charlie forgot the fake IDs for the trip to Southern California. I was upstairs, and I heard somebody uh, banging on the door real hard, and I was wondering who the heck it was. I come by the top of the stairs looking looking down, and, and uh, the next thing you know, the, they swung the door open and they come running in, you know, FBI agents, running up the stairs, you know. I, where was I going to run? You know, I mean, there's nowhere to run, I mean, you know. They, so they had me, you know. I'm sort of dumbfounded for for a moment, you know. And uh, then I realized uh, that uh, 
Well, at first they said that I was under arrest for probation violation, you know. Uh, but I knew it was more than that. What exactly they had on me, I had no, I, I had no idea. But uh, they said they're uh, leaving a uh, uh, probation violation for leaving the state. Uh, so well, uh, they had me some way. Rudyard Avenue, where Philip was arrested on the probation violation. I'll tell you who was there. Sergeant Kavasik was there. Detective Rocco Plutra was there. John Roberson, who was the boss of the FBI bank robbery squad, was there. Well, after we made the arrest, the arrest was made, Sergeant Kavasik went upstairs and confronted him and with the FBI. And there was a lot of cash. Because I, didn't, I believe some of the cash was from the Lordstown bank robbery. Christopher, of course, said it was his life savings from the sale of the Redwood. Believe whatever you want to believe. When we got all got busted and and, and uh, Charlie didn't get arrested, I thought, well, I, I better give him the stuff to hold for me, so I, and I don't have to lose it. You know, I figured that uh, I would be able to trust him. So I don't know what the worth of that gold and diamonds were, but uh, he beat me for all of that. Most of these guys have a stash. Now I don't know how big the stash is, or maybe they fritted it away. But my understanding, most of these people had a stash someplace in case a rainy day comes and they have some money that they can fall back on. I would uh, bury it uh, in the ground. I'd, I'd dig a hole in the ground, put a, 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 a little container in there and then put it, stuff in there and cover it up. We got a call one day from Jan Roberson, Eddie Kovacic, Sergeant Kovacic, myself. Uh, they're going to Youngstown to do a search. And uh, now the Cleveland police are in Youngstown. We're searching, well, I think it was one of the Denzio's houses. He had a talker that was telling him that these bonds were buried in a place, and he got the Army, the engineers, or the National Guard to, to dig up a field looking for these bonds and things. I don't know to this day where the bonds are. I know they found a bunch buried in Youngstown. I forget how many million it was they found buried. Um, where the rest are, I have no idea. Well, they don't want you going after that because all the money they've ever earned is illegitimate. It's got to go back to the owners. And they never really trust anybody, especially in law enforcement. <clears throat> they may say in a general area that, yeah, I heard that there were millions taken out of it, but they'll never confirm a figure. And all the people who did that bank robbery, they knew, uh, maybe not to the penny, but they, you know how many millions in bearer bonds are because they, they went through Louisiana, they fenced them to Carlos Marcellus. And if he was giving them like 30 or 40 cents on the dollar, if they had $10 million and they got 4 million, you know, you could go back and say, all right, uh, 40 cents on the dollar, you must've had 10 million in bearer bonds. The other stuff, the gold coins and, and jewelry and cash, uh, they would know how much it is because each one of them wants to make sure they get their fair share, but they're not gonna tell you. At least they didn't tell me. I asked Phil the question, when you mentioned how much he said they got out of that Laguna Nigel. And we were talking like you and I are talking now. And I'd go, come on, Phil, don't give me any of that crap. I know you got away with millions. Oh, Carmen, it was never that much. And we were almost like on a first name basis at the time we were talking. I could never get anything out of him. He just wasn't going to say anything. Certainly, whatever fees I got uh, from my client did not come from that source. Even if it did, I wouldn't have known, and I don't think I would have had to report it, but it didn't. As the feds hunted down the stolen loot, Phil began serving a sentence at Terre Haute Federal Prison in Indiana. Terre Haute Prison was a very, very bad place. I, I remember the first year I was there, I seen seven people get killed. It was a very, very, very dangerous institution. Though Terre Haute was filled with tough characters, it was a welcome change from the short-term facilities that Phil had spent 13 months in awaiting his long-term home. He soon fell in with a crew of Italians who were connected to various mob outfits on the outside. His reputation as a super thief earned respect and safety among some of the nation's most hardened criminals. Phil made it his mission to stay out of trouble and earn his parole as quickly as possible. Well, I, fe I felt that uh, I uh, I did the right, uh, made all the right moves, done all the right things that uh, I was taught while I was there. 
the Mulder guys. They were all few, quite a few years older than me, and some much year, quite a years older than me. And uh, they always used to give me uh, the idea of what to do to better myself to in order to make early parole. That was the whole game. Phil earned his parole after only serving three years of his 20-year sentence. He did time. He earned his parole. I mean, he, well, he when he was in prison, he worked like a job. I think he worked for, like, the, the warden or the assistant warden. I can't remember. It was somebody high up in the staff, and he did a great job for him. And they went to bat for him. I mean, they, they talked how good he was. And he got released. He got a job. He went to a halfway house. After Phil's parole, Mary Jane Wogey, a reporter for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, wrote a series of articles criticizing the authorities for Phil's early release. Mary Jane Wogey was a Plain Dealer newspaper woman who uh, was responsible for getting my parole rescinded. Well, an issue that happened was when I was in the halfway house uh, in Cleveland, she called there quite a few times. She said, well, I, I thought maybe you could help me out, write, write this book, you know. And I says, well, like I say, you know, you know, I want to forget about everything and you know, go on with my life. Well, the next morning I wake up and I come downstairs and I read this newspaper. It says, uh, uh, super thief released on parole while Luke's still missing. I said, oh my God, this woman, she's writing about me. So anyway, she caused more, more stink and she kept writing articles day after day, and uh, and she she uh, called uh, the Bureau of Prisons, and she called uh, the prosecutors, and she just caused so much turmoil that uh, they rescinded my parole. And I tried to fight it, but I lost, and I had to uh, go back uh, to prison. I can understand, you know, he's a he's a career criminal, and they use that also to flap him, flap him, send him back. I don't know what right she had to do that. You know, he was paroled, he hadn't done anything, so how could you rescind it? How can you, I remember thinking, how can you do that? How can that be allowed? I know he's a criminal, but he did his time, he was home, so he deserved the right to go ahead and continue and try and do the right thing. But how can a person try and do the right thing when you're going to pursue them? When is it ever done then? Is it, is it never done? Again, Phil found himself behind bars in a federal prison. In 1981, a body washed up on the shore of Lake Erie. Again, Phil Christopher found himself in front of a judge. This time, Phil was on the hook for a case that he thought he had long ago left behind. The 1968 murder of Arnie Prunella. Phil Christopher refused to name any names but his own. He made a plea bargain for a charge of manslaughter in the Prunella case. Though he had avoided a murder rap, he earned a 20-year extension to his sentence. Has he done bad things? Yes, he has. And it's hard for me to realize that my day to day when I look at him and I talk to him because that's not who I see. I've never seen that side of him. I would like people to know that he is a very caring, loving, gentle man. He is not someone that would just walk out on the street and hurt somebody. That is not who he is. That is not what he did. I'm sure there'll be many people that'll look at and hear this and say the woman's insane. But the fact of the matter is, it's an old cliche, but it's very true. The things that went on were part of doing business, day-to-day -day business in that world. That's not who he is. That's not what he does now. That's what was done then. Anybody that's in that life is just part of doing business. I wanted to make money. I wanted to become a millionaire. That was my thought. I wanted to become a millionaire. Not that I, I really think about that anymore now. You know, I mean, just after all these years of prison, you know, who wants to be a, you know, I just want to live life. After serving his longest stretch to date, Phil was finally released from prison in 2009. When you're riding the wave of the criminal world, you're having a good time, what you think you are, but in all actuality, 
when it comes down to it, you're by yourself. You're in that cell by yourself and your life and your family are going by and you can't stop it and you're not a part of it. For them, time stops from where they were arrested. So when they get out, time is actually where they left it when they were arrested. It takes an awful lot for them to get to where, they're, where they should be. I'm not a monster. I'm, I'm, I'm a very, very quiet person. I keep to myself, I always did keep to myself, and, and, uh, and uh, I had a lot of good, good friends that I'd be hung around together. Very friendly. I think he can get along with anybody. Uh, had a great smile. All the girls thought he was handsome. That's left me out, but, but uh, he, just, he was a good guy to be around. We had a lot of fun. And uh, I think he was a loyal friend, too. I think he was very loyal to his friends. Phil is uh, one of, if not the most successful burglar in the United States. When you look at what he's done, uh, breaking into banks, uh, defeating alarm systems, taking out huge amounts of money with his uh, crew, he, he ranks at or very near the top. Uh, Super Thief was an apt uh, nickname that was given to him. I considered him a friend, but I haven't seen him lately. Maybe you can tell me how long he's been out. <laughs> I know I know he's out, but I, I, I can't speak on it. But he was one of the Collinwood boys. He was one of the Collinwood boys. The 1972 burglary of the Laguna Niguel branch of United California Bank remains the biggest in US history, with a haul of an estimated $30 million. The distinction a small compensation for Phil, who is finally setting in to a normal life, working a nine to five as a structural iron worker to support his family. Though he didn't attain his goal of becoming a millionaire, it's a welcome change after having spent 32 of his 66 years behind bars. I'm tired of doing time. 27 years of prison, you know, it's enough to change anybody from anything. You know, sometimes uh, enough is enough, like uh, like an alcoholic or or a drug addict or anything else. Enough is enough. You know, it's it's uh, uh, this forgetting and change my lifestyle. I've seen Phil Christopher. You know, within the last couple of months, he still looks like he's he's capable. I mean, he's like all of us. The hair is thinning. He's still in pretty decent shape. And I would describe him as a uh, career, lifelong professional criminal. I think once you go down the trail to be a career criminal, I think you're a career criminal until you die, you know? You know, sometimes, uh, you know, I kiddingly, kiddingly said to my wife one day, I said, you know, things get any worse, I might have to break out the tools. And she said, don't, don't start that, you know? But I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to uh, do that because uh, I don't need to I have to worry about looking over my back anymore. Uh, I mean, uh, enough's enough. You know, I mean, it's time to say burglary is uh, over with. I, I'll say it. He was really kind of like a class act whenever you met him or talked to him. And my partner and I would talk to him every once in a while. I'll stop the car and talk to him. I have to say, of all the guys that I've talked to in organized crime, he and Freddie Emma, um, without sounding too effeminate, were almost charming to talk to. These guys were disarming. Phil Christopher, you could talk to him all day long. Since the, the bank burglars were successful, I think he was a good bank burglar. I am not aware of anything that Christopher did that led to his apprehension, except <laughs> he screwed up when he uh, when he traveled to uh, from uh, Cleveland to uh, Los Angeles uh, using his own name. He uh, probably only mistake was he picked uh, two Denzels and Mulligan to run with there. That's about it. I understand he's a uh, he was a successful criminal before, and he's been a successful criminal since. So for all I know, he's still doing a good job. 
and I think he had to do it all over again. He would hone some of his other skills and he would have been a professional person as opposed to the criminal. Um, Does crime pay? It does pay. It does have its uh, sort of benefits at the beginning. You have that wild, wild little time, you know, you know, living on the fast lane. That's about. Uh, but uh, does it pay in the long run? No, it doesn't pay in the long. Run.